Welcome back guys. Today we are going to make our inverters or our charge controllers wireless. So if you want to do this as well and hook them up to something else than a cable to actually send the data and even in the future receive data or set data wirelessly, you should take a look at this video now. I know that you can buy devices like this from different shops, but this device is open source, free to use and yeah. To do the build we need a couple of things. First of all, we need one ESP8266. You can of course go with ESP32 as well, but I have chosen the cheaper ESP8266 for this purpose and it's good enough. The disadvantage here is that it only have one full-blown TXRX or RS232 port, the serial port that is on the hardware side. So you can't debug it at the same time as you're running it and it can't program it when it is all hooked up. So before we're going to hook this up, you need to program it. But first, let's talk about all the gear that we need. So this is the ESP8266. You also need a TTL converter to convert the signals from this one towards the inverter. Because the inverter itself is around plus minus 5 volt or even up to 12 volt in terms of the serial port signals. This one here takes care of that logic, as you can see on the back side. Yeah. It's a little bit hard to get focus. It says RS232 RS to TTL. Uh, I have all the links in the bottom here. And the components to do this is very, very cheap. Those two you need. Uh, you will be needing a couple of wires, of course. I'm using silicone based wires. They are very easy to bend and work with. I'm going to use some kind of box to contain it all in and this is a pre-made or pre-bought box. Uh, rather small but it fits for this purpose. Um, you can of course 3D print one as well but I was lazy today and I have tons of these small boxes that I need to use so I'm going to use them. To connect it into the inverter, depending on if it is a PCM60X, that it is in my case, you're going to use the RG45 wires. So this manual here, so this video here is actually covering that part. You can use any RG45 cable that you have laying around. You just need to make sure that the correct order inside here. But I have the drawings down below for that as well. So this is all the gear that you need. You also need to power this device and I checked the, the PCM60X and the MPI that I have and none of those are supplying any power on the serial port itself. And that's a little bit too bad I would say. So I need to have an external powering for this one and I'm actually going to hook it up on the USB or on the micro USB port itself. But you can of course solder the wires together also. I'm going to use one 8266 on each device. So let's start by first programming this device and then we'll come back and build it. So boom. now it's time to get the software on to the ESP8266. And there is basically two different ways of doing this. And either you go the normal way by programming it via the Arduino IDE. But then you need to have Arduino IDE downloaded, installed. You need to have all the libraries installed. And that can be a little bit cumbersome. I agree with that. So, but I actually added another way to do it. And that is I actually uploaded a secondary binary file that is pre-compiled for you just to run. I have made one that works with a D1 Wemos Mini and it will also most likely work with other ESP8266 but I'm using the Wemos Mini so that's the one I have built it for. Before you actually attach everything up it's time to program it. You hook the Wemos Mini up to your computer via the USB cable. It's just a matter of plugging it in and then you need to get some of the software. If you use Arduino IDE you should get everything and just download the whole library. But if you don't, you can actually go into the source folder. And you can see here we have a source Ino generic binary. And this is the one that you should be downloading. So go into that one and download that file. Next part is to actually flash this into the Vimos Mini. And there is many different softwares that you can use to do this. 
since I used a lot of Tasmotized hardware uh, with Tasmota running, I also use their Tasmotizer software. It works pretty good. There are others that you can use and you can use Python directly. But for me, this is the software I go to. So I bring up the Tasmotizer. You have all kinds of versions on this GitHub here, so you can install them directly. You need to plug it in, as I said before, make sure you have refreshed and you pick the COM port that is for the VMOS Mini. You then need to go in here and select the binary that you just downloaded. In this case, this is the binary I have here. You need to make sure that you have erase before flashing, because if you don't have that, you might have old crap in the memory that will cause issues. And if everything is fine now, when you press Tasmotize, it will connect to the ESP, like in my case here. It will start to flash a lot, and it starts by re-raising the memory, and then it will program. And that was a success. Don't forget to power cycle device the device now, otherwise you may get other strange issues. So during the first startup, it will now create an AP called set soul. So you need to log on to that access point, and then you have to surf to HTTP colon backslash backslash and this IP. When you surf to the device, it will look roughly like this. You can ignore the IP in this case because I already changed the IP, but you need to do it via your phone. So when you go into the phone and you press configure Wi-Fi, it may be that you need to press twice sometimes, it will look like this. Of course, it depends on what type of access points you have available. So please pick the ones that you want this to reside on, and then you add the password here. You press submit, and this is now set. When this is set, I do recommend to actually restart device before you continue. So I now restart my device, get it up and running again. The question now when you have set the Wi-Fi is actually to find the device. How do you find the new IP? And that is something that you need to look into how you do in your router. So next part is configure MQTT. You need to define your MQTT server. The port is most likely 1883. You need to have an MQTT user and an MQTT password. It's also time to define the type that you're going to use. In the current version, the PCM and the MPI is the only types that are configured for MQTT. The PIP will be added very, very shortly, but I need someone to test it out. So if you want to test it out, let me know down in the comments. I'm going to use the MPI, and then I'm doing, going to have a test name for this, MPI test, and the update rate currently is not in use. You save the settings, and you go back. After setting the MQTT, you go back and either press reboot device or even better, just pull the plug and reboot it manually it's yourself. When this is done, it should actually start to send the data. So if we search for this one here, we named it MPI test, you will see that this device is now online. You can also see that it has been up and running for roughly 30 seconds and this will every three seconds or so turn upwards. So this tells us that this device is now in use and you can start to solder the last piece. So let's time to build it. First of all, let's take this one here and make sure that you have pre-soldered everything. So the TX and the RX we need and we are going to use the ground and a 3.3 volt. And then we do the same thing on this small board here to make sure that everything is pre-soldered. What's important now is the direction of how you put this little board up and down. If you have seen my earlier videos where I used this board to connect it to the Raspberry Pi, where I actually made this wire here that have the Raspberry Pi connector, the RG45, and inside here, you have that little bit of converter. That's the same principle now, except instead of Raspberry Pi, we're going to hook it up to this ESP8266 board here and make sure that it actually is wireless. So the importance, as I said, is to connect in the correct direction. And the RS232 side 
is the one on the left here and that's the one that goes to the inverter and the TTL side goes to the ESP8266. So let's start by soldering them all together. I always use the green on the TX on the ESP8266. Let's do it here as well. The yellow on the RX. And then we have need to have ground. And 3.3 volt. If you need to reprogram this board, it's really simple to do that, but you need to disconnect one of the wires here. In this case, you need to disconnect the RX wire. If you do that, you can actually program this afterwards, or you can actually add a switch as well to do it. And on the board, it's pretty simple. You can see the arrows, like the bottom one goes that way. That means that that is TX, and that should go to the RX there, and the green should go to the next one. So let me turn this around. So this one goes here. And then you have minus on the bottom here. And the positive goes to that one. So in this box, I'm actually going to add this switch to show you guys that it is possible to have it like that. If you want to reprogram it or change it, I recommend to have the switch, but you don't really need it. But I need it in this case because I'm still developing it. We have the lead there on that side and we want that to be visible on the outside. So we need to drill another hole and I also want the USB part to be able to reach it on the outside. I have no need for getting access to the reset button because that's not really needed in this case. So I'm going to mark out, drill another hole. We also need to connect the cable there. The dark brown is the negative one. White orange is the TX from the inverter. And that goes to RX on the TTL board. And the orange one is the RX on the inverter. And that goes to the TX on the TTL board. Now we also need to have this tied in here, and I'm going to put it like that. So let's put some hot glue here. Make sure that the hot glue is hot, otherwise it won't work really good. And keep the lead in the middle. You should be able to see the lead just a little bit there. And the trick here is actually just to add a, a tad bit of glue like that. Because then it's airtight, but still it's see-through. So let me tie this up. We need to add two diodes and we're going to do that directly and I want them to be placed roughly around here one there and let's say one there so the diodes I'm using is just normal 5 millimeter diodes and I'm using two resistors the resistors is roughly 200 ohms I think and I'm going to drive them on the ESP board itself so, so we have two holes here and on the LEDs, you have one long and one short pin. The long one is the positive and the short one goes to ground. So always be aware of that when you are putting them in. And since this one sits roughly like that, I want the green to be to the right. So let's put the red to the left. So now we need to tie them in and we have, it will be powered by D1 and D2. Now we need D2 as well. And then we have 
the negative here. And we have ground on that spot there. And I just push in the leads a little bit because I don't want them to stick out that far. Then we add some hot glue on the back side. And let's go mount it. Double sided tape here. Let's add that to the back side. First of all, we remove the protection here. And then we take this one and we're going to plug it in. So let's remove the old cable. And this one here is my old system. Uh, it won't be used anymore. So I'm going to put this one here, plugging it in, make sure it sits. So the cable actually go really, really nice here in the underside, like that. So that's how it's going to look. And my goal is actually to be powering it and having a PSU inside here that is powered from the DC part that goes from a roughly 55 volt down to 5 volt for the ACES. But for now, for this video, I'm hooking it up to this kind of, yeah, you could call it a power bank. It's nice for us doing 18650 because it actually holds for 18650. As you can see, it works really good inside. And one screwed in place, it's time to put in the power. So you can see the red LED is lighting up. That means it doesn't have any contact with the inverter or the charger. And now it have. And now it's green. That means it's now have contact with my MQTT server and it's sending the data. So if we take a look at the MQTT part and I have logged in via MQTT Explorer and I browse parts that comes from this device itself, you can see that I'm sending uptime, both in a human readable format, but also in seconds. And I'm also sending some Wi-Fi details that you can see here. And I have the normal values for battery voltage, solar voltage, amp. So we have the wattage and we have the solar amper. We also have all those values in a nicely format JSON format. This is what will be coming in the near future in all this software where I use everything in JSON because it makes it a little bit easier to handle on the receiving side, I would say. But at the same time, I don't have to same send as many messages from the system itself. The controllers are now built. As you can see here, you have the LEDs connected to the system. And currently I have this switch here for programming. You don't need to add that one, but it basically disconnects the inverter. So if I disconnect the inverter here, you can see on the LED, it now has stating that it have lost connection to the inverter or charger itself. So it's very easy to see what's going on. The red LED is for the charger inverter to see if it can talk to it. And the green LED is if it has contact with the MQTT server. So if we add the cable back in, you can see that it doesn't take long until it actually have contact again and sending data. And of course, the blue little LED from the inside is showing when it actually is sending the data. So if you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up. And if you want to support my channel and the work I do, please check out the links down below, buy some gear, use the affiliate links, or you can just leave me a message of what you think of this video. So thank you guys and see you next time. Bye.